Tunaka and welcome to Reset Fiji, a platform for robust discussions, ideas, innovations and solutions. I'm Stanley Simpson and tonight's panel will be discussing education. The impact of COVID-19 has become a defining moment for our formal education system, our children, parents and scholars. The unprecedented lockdown and closure of schools, universities and learning institutions for three months has forced educators across the country to transition to a world of virtual learning. Reopening schools and meeting stringent protocols and health standards has created challenges for a conducive learning environment. Social distancing measures, class size reductions, and the suspension of playtime, sports and arts have potentially impacted an entire generation of school leavers. Also on the rise, the increasing mental health issues among students and educators. As with other sectors, the pandemic, however, provides an opportunity to reassess our formal learning environment, to innovate an environment or engage methodolo methodologies that develop a love for knowledge, for learning, and new skills, and to recognize alternative ways of learning outside of schools and universities, including our ETOK system, that can help students and our people learn, grow, and thrive. Now, joining me on Reset tonight on this uh, education panel is Larry Thomas, playwright, writer, director, and documentary filmmaker. Dr. Nilesh Gounda, the senior lecturer at the University of the South Pacific and chairman of TSI, TISI Sangam Education Board. Hector Hatch is a deputy, deputy principal of International Secondary School in Suva. Ufemia Dhamaitonga is a national president of the Fiji Early Childhood Teachers Association and Sarah Mayambai, founder of the Rugby Academy of Fiji and Bai Agro Rugby Farms. Panelists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Reset Fiji panel on education. And now, let me introduce our first speaker for the evening, Larry Thomas. He's a playwright, writer, director, and documentary filmmaker. He has worked at the University of the South Pacific in several capacities as a course developer in what was then the extension services from 2005 to 2014, for about 10 years, he was the coordinator of the Regional Media Center with the Pacific Community, SPC, and for a very brief period, he taught at Maris Brothers High School. Larry, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Stan, Ulvenaka, everybody, and um, it's nice, uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I'm really just going to talk from my own uh, personal experiences. Huh? Um, and experiences of, of teaching, but also uh, as, an, as an artist, as an, as a writer. I think we have to um, rethink, relook, and reimagine our education system. Um, we have to make it a bit more enabling and exciting for, for students to, uh, to want to learn. We inherited an education system uh, from the colonial times and very little has been done to overhaul that uh, education system. Some of our uh, leaders, our academics, our intellectuals have come through that system and have done very well and it's a system that has served us very well. But we haven't, I don't think, looked at that system and adapted it for the current, uh, the current time. Um, I think it's, it's a system that is quite uh, um, outdated and um, that doesn't accommodate what, um, what we're going through right now. Um, I think we have a system where children actually learn in fear. Um, they're told that it's either right or wrong black or white, good or bad. There's nothing in between. Um, and, and I think this, this, this fear, it's, it's part also of our own cultural uh, upbringing that is inculcate, inculcated as, uh, in, with, with, uh, when growing up. And of course, this extends to the school system where we are taught by teachers who are good, but they're also part of this uh, cultural tradition 
and, and ways of, uh, of learning. Um, our, our education system really, in, in my view, comes down to, to economics. What, um, what professions, what jobs that you can do that will earn you um, an income. And, and often we go to the traditional uh, professions of teachers, doctors, lawyers, uh, accountants, uh, so on and, and so forth. Eh? And we don't look at the creative industry. We, our, our system, our education system does not encourage creativity. Uh, it's completely, and in my view, totally lacking. And someone who's come through the, 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 the local school system, I can, you know, uh, attest to that. My interest in, uh, in theater, my interest in writing, has come about because of one person in particular who was passionate about theater and passed that on to me and to a group of people. But I seem to be the only person who's been working in theater for a very long time. And it continues to be, to be a challenge to the point now where I don't want to work in theater because there aren't people around who can, who can, uh, who can help me. And um, so what I think is, is, is an environment that is completely lacking in, in nurturing talent, in nurturing creativity uh, within, within our school systems. Eh? Um, we, we are, our, our, our teachers are too busy fulfilling administrative obligations and ticking the boxes um, to have the time to really just spend time with students to, 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 to nurture them. Um, I want to just talk about three, three things that um, I would like to, 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 to mention. Um, these, are, these are not new, um, but I think we need to reinforce it and perhaps take it very, very seriously. And what can we do to try and um, not so much change the, the, the system, but add to what we already have. And as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to remove what doesn't work and keep what, uh, what works. Eh? Um, most of the schools, in fact, all the schools, with, with exception of the international and the, and the private schools, don't have subjects in, in media, media, media studies. Now, we, we have a, a Film Fiji, which uh, for a very long time has been encouraging filmmakers to come, uh, to, come to Fiji to make films, and they get a, uh, a tax, there's a tax incentive. But there's no such thing for local filmmakers. And an initiative that was uh, done many years ago by Film Fiji was the Cooler Film Awards. And the Cooler Film Awards encouraged um, high school students to make short films, to write short films, to shoot the films, to edit the films themselves with the help of people in the industry. And I was personally involved in that for a number of years in my capacity uh, as uh, media center coordinator. And uh, it was fun to, to see these young kids making a short film. And what was really enjoyable was just seeing them think, just to think, which is so lacking. We don't encourage our students to think to, or to think independently because for fear that they will be told, no, it is wrong. This is the answer. Um, and so these young students worked on, on subjects such as uh, rape, <laughs> uh, teenage pregnancies, and the one thing that was really reflective was the subjects that they chose. These were subjects that they lived in, I mean, they, they were part of, rather, and from, from their own environment and what resonated with them. And sometimes these were very, very sad subjects. But my point here is, in, in introducing media studies, is that we nurture from high school young filmmakers, writers, directors, 
camera people, editors. But they get as far as FNU, if those who are interested, FNU offers a certificate in, um, in film and television. But when they come out, what do they have? Nothing, absolutely nothing. You know? And so if we introduce media studies, we introduce creative writing, we used to do drama, we introduce design, and we've seen with, with the, the Fiji fashion show over the last 10 years, just the amazing talent and skills of designers. You know, and when we have an industry, a creative industry, and we're looking at film, we pull in these people, we, the, the, uh, the designers, the, the set constructions, as, uh, uh, builders who build sets, uh, makeup artists, costumes. Um, we have the skills, but we just don't nurture them. We just don't, we just don't nurture them. Um, and another, another subject that I think should be introduced is cultural studies. We have really vibrant cultures. You know, our two main eth ethnic uh, groups have rich uh, cultures. If we introduce cultural studies, it, it goes a long way in creating understanding of not only us, but our environment, the other groups that live here, but also our neighboring Pacific Islands. And I think we, we need to um, also look at, 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 the, at our Pacific Islands, but also at traditional, at traditional, uh, traditional cultures. I think language, language is really important, and it's been talked about a long time of uh, Itoke and, and Hindi being introduced. I think it needs to be mandatory that Hindi and Itoke language needs to be introduced right from primary school, class one, to, to, to high school, where students can have the option to then um, uh, take it as, as an exam subject. And given that some of our neighboring countries also speak French, perhaps French should also be, um, be an option. Um, and the... Uh, so, yeah, so, so media studies, looking at, at, the, at the creative arts, looking at, uh, at language, and, and looking at cultural studies. I think these are the three subjects. The second point is, um, when addressing our education system, so often we, we don't think about the teachers. And we mustn't neglect the teachers. Um, we, and from my own experience, um, we have class, classes, class sizes, sometimes 40, between 40 and 50. And from my own experience of, of, of teaching, at the end of one period, I'm exhausted. Because I, I enjoy teaching, I put everything into one class, I come out exhausted in the first period, and I have you know, other classes to teach throughout the day. Um, so I think we need to also allow professional developments for our teachers, so that they can enjoy what they're teaching, you know, as opposed to being tired and, and stressed and, and don't enjoy teaching. And it shouldn't just be um, um, a job. Um, Reading, reading, we lament, continuously lament that our students don't read. And there are very re a lot of uh, various reasons for that. And I'll just talk briefly uh, about uh, my experience of teaching. And with the approval of the HOD English, I asked if I would just have a period of reading. So I brought magazines and books and I told the students who were completely shocked that we, this period will just be reading. And so over the course of time that I was uh, teaching uh, at Marist, we would just have reading sessions. So they could bring in their books or magazines, and I'd bring in books and magazines for those who didn't have it and, and shared it. And I walked around the class. I just didn't sit and read my book, but I walked around and asked them, what are you reading? What is it about? And, the, and in, in also part of this, this uh, subject, I well, I not introduced, but I, I, I had discussions. So I would come in in the morning and say, okay, we're going to just have a chat. We're going to just talk. And again, I talked earlier about thinking. You know, they're so afraid to think. And so the headlines today is this. What do you think? And I was very careful and mindful not to tell anyone, no, that's, that doesn't work. That's a wrong answer. Never once, because I... I grew up in, in, in this system and was always very hurtful to be told, oh, that's a stupid answer, that's a wrong answer. And so we just clamp up. And so what, involved was, what, what was involved was students would just give an opinion. 
And for me, one of the highlights of, of this was, I, again, just came into class one day, I said, we're going to have a debate of whether there is a God or not, which was completely shocking for this uh, Catholic school. And so those who are Christians and those who are non-Christians. So I said, just have a discussion. There's no right or wrong answer. What, I, what I'm interested in is to hear your opinion. Of course, the person who eventually won was a Hindu, and simply because he has had good arguments. The Christians were getting very angry because they just couldn't argue about the existence of God and whether there's a heaven or a hell. But what it did was it allowed for just interesting, healthy discussion. And I just did this all the time. And one day I walked into Form 7 class and I said, okay, I'm going to read you a fairy tale. They looked at me as if I was mad. I said, yes, I'm going to read you a fairy tale, and it's about death, but it's a fairy tale that's going to come again in the spring. And they were all fidgety. You know, these are 19-year-old, 18, 19-year-old young men. And as I began to read the story, there was quiet in the class. At the end of the story, there was pin drop silence. And they said, is there another story you can read? And this is it. And because my passion is drama, I ensured that they also enjoyed drama. And both the sixth and seventh form, not a single student enjoyed or liked English. And that was a challenge for me. And so at the end of three months, they were asking if we would do poetry, which is, which is a lot of people, even teachers, are afraid of to teach because they think there's something hidden in poetry. Um, and that if you don't understand it, um, it's, it's, it's a big problem. And I think, um, yeah, those, those are the three things of, of subjects, looking at teachers, and also the importance of, uh, of reading. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Great points there. Uh, something to ponder on before we move on to the next speaker. I just wanted to ask you, when you talked about the reading and, uh, and the writing, because you, talk, you mentioned the system that we're in is outdated. But this was the system that produced the novelists, the poets, the playwrights. Uh, one would argue that where we are now in a technological driven education system, that we're not producing these novelists, playwrights, and poets anymore. So how do you see how you, we manage that? Thank you, Stan. That's a, that's a good point. Um, it's up to the individual. It's up to the individual. If I, my passion for, 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 uh, for literature, for drama, for, for writing, was my own interest. And I was passionate about it. And I think like anything, you know, any, if you're, like sports, if, if you're passionate about something, you just do it. And if I thought that writing wasn't going to bring me an income, I, I would have stopped a long time ago. And fortunately, I had, to, I had, a, I had a, a, a job that I could earn and pay the bills, but it never stopped my passion for writing and for theater. And for the last 30 years, I do it because it's a passion. And so, but unfortunately for a lot of people who are artists, and there are many artists who are struggling out there, whether you're a designer, you're a painter, you're a sculptor, or a weaver, you're struggling because there is no income. And so I think it's the, it's the individual. But also we have, to, we have to have a nurturing environment. And, and there is completely lack of support from the place where support is supposed to be given. Um, and so often at a very young age, students just drop out. And I, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's, it's the individual. Great, we can discuss that uh, more later. Now we move on to Dr. Nilesh Gounda. He's a senior lecturer at economics at USP. He is also the chairman of the TISI Sangam Education Board, which manages 21 primary schools and five secondary schools in Fiji. Dr. Gounda will be talking about the key role that civil society and religious organizations play in providing access to education in Fiji. He will also highlight recent education reforms and possible implications, Dr. Nilesh Gaunda. Thank you, Stanley. I think Larry has provided a very good overview of the teaching and learning side of the schooling system. I'll try to focus on a bit of historical overview of uh, where we have come in terms of our primary and secondary uh, schooling education system, say, in the last 120 years, 
and then I'll briefly look at recent, uh, recent reforms. One of the most uh, innovating uh, things to happen uh, in Fiji is the, is the community partnership. And 99% uh, of the schools in Fiji are currently owned by community and religious based organizations or faith based organizations. There's only about 1% of schools which are owned by the, the government or state. In Australia, it's actually the other way around. So one can imagine if these community based organizations or community run schools or faith based organizations or religious organizations had not uh, got together uh, to, to build schools. Uh, what would have been the situation in terms of access to, to schooling or education in Fiji. So I, I want to begin by, by recognizing the effort of these community and faith-based uh, organizations. I think uh, the, the spirit of coming together and, and, and pooling resources, uh, getting fundraising uh, to build schools uh, and, and, and starting education in rural areas, in outlying islands, is one of the strengths of our education system and which has continued to, to, uh, to forge ahead until now. And, and we need to, to, to recognize that. And, uh, and as times change, and as Larry has mentioned, uh, new things come in education and, and uh, the reforms uh, will always come and we need to see uh, how to, to, to handle reforms and how to approach reforms and what are the impact of these, um, these reforms. So uh, what we have seen now as a result of COVID-19 uh, crisis is uh, job losses and, and the impact on economic activity. Uh, based on FNPF figures, there are about 85,000 uh, people who have lost jobs. These are the ones who have uh, who applied for assistance from FNPF. This is huge. It, the number may be even somewhere around 100,000, which means about 35% of people are currently unemployed in Fiji. And uh, children from these households uh, are, are coming to schools now. And we need to see and consider how we can help these children who are currently in the schooling, uh, schooling system. It's not only in terms of uh, additional support uh, in the teaching and learning process, but also through other means, such as uh, providing them with meals, uh, etc. And one of the things that uh, schools are currently doing is to, is to provide meals uh, to children who are attending uh, these schools and who come from uh, households where at least someone has lost a job. The incomes uh, have, have gone down. Many of the children cannot afford to, to, to bring to school uh, proper meals. So once again, we are seeing the spirit of community uh, partnership at the forefront where uh, communities are taking upon themselves to help uh, the children who are in need of uh, additional help uh, or, or support. This, uh, most of the international organizations are now talking about um, the community public partnership. This has been existing in Fiji for more than 100 years now. And uh, what the state or the government needs to do is go back and relook at this community state partnership, uh, how to harness the existing power of community state partnership so we can, uh, we can strengthen our schooling system uh, in terms of uh, curriculum or relationship between different stakeholders, etc. More recently, we have seen in Fiji uh, recent reforms which have brought about a lot of distress and tension uh, within the schooling system, both between the state and um, the school management, but also with the state and the teachers. And I think any education reform must be consulted widely, because if it's not consulted and education reforms are brought overnight, this can only bring more distress and tension uh, within, within the system. So I just want to highlight that we have uh, existing education system in terms of ownership and access to education, which is rooted in our communities. And there's a lot of community spirit and strength has gone into the existing schools and the way schools are managed and run. And it's important for the state to continue with this uh, community state partnership, but also strengthen the relationship that is, uh, that is currently there in terms of um, managing and operating these, um, these schools. 
while the school management don't have a lot of say in, in curriculum development or curriculum reforms, uh, a lot, the Ministry of Education plays a key role, uh, but it's important that they do consult uh, parents, uh, teacher unions, teachers, uh, as well as um, school managements, because at the end of the day, curriculums cannot be implemented if you don't have a, have a school. Curriculums are actually implemented in the classroom, so it's important to consult the teachers as well as um, school managements. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Gandhi. It's a very practical, uh, practical statements there. Of course, I mean the experience that uh, TSI, uh, TSI Sangam has had, and I know a lot of your schools are managed by former principals. Uh, you know, they're in the board. People like Amra and I do, plenty of the others that are there, so they bring a lot of, lot of things to the table. I would like to just talk about what you mentioned about the community spirit and strength, because that is what has been keeping our community alive and going at this time. And I know with your support for the schools, I know the feeding of uh, students uh, within the TSI schools. So I would like to just talk about how we can harness that strength of the community spirit and strength in terms of um, in terms of reforms and, uh, and taking education forward uh, into, see what, what Larry talking about, rethinking, relooking, reimagining our education system. Yeah. Uh, I think behind the, the community spirit and togetherness is charity and volunteerism. If you take out charity and volunteerism out of this spirit of community togetherness, then we can't really harness uh, the existing power of, of the way the community and the state operate. So it's very important to maintain a good relationship amongst all the stakeholders. And it's important for the state, which provides the teachers and pays for the teachers uh, and provides the curriculum, but the land and the buildings belongs to the community or to the faith-based organization or to the religious organization. So it's very important to maintain good relationship amongst all the stakeholders. And maintaining good relationship means consulting each other talking to each other. Uh, reforms cannot be brought uh, without consultation of all the relevant stakeholders. And what we have seen in Fiji is, is reforms that were brought quickly without consultation with teacher unions, school management, uh, parents, or other stakeholders. So I think one way to, to, to continue with this existing relationship and, and maintain that community spirit and togetherness is to continue to have dialogue and if changes are to be brought in, it must be widely consulted and discussed with all stakeholders. It must have clear aims and objectives, and it must clearly outline what is likely to be the impact or the output and the outcomes. And we need to distinguish between the, the output and the outcomes in terms of what education reform is trying to, trying to bring. So if we say that curriculum reform should, will, will end up increasing pass rates, that's just the uh, output. What is the outcome of increasing pass rates? So it's, reforms must be about outputs as well as outcomes. I think once we have output and outcomes, it'll be very clear to all the stakeholders what exactly are we talking about and what are we targeting here? What are we looking for? So when reforms are, uh, have been implemented, when it's time to go back and look at uh, the, the outcome of reforms, we are clear. We can distinguish between output and and, and, and outcomes. Thank you. So we may have an outdated system, but if you're bringing in something new, make sure you consult and engage uh, and don't just try and throw it in. Eh? Well, I just want to recap at this stage uh, for our viewers. Uh, Reset Fiji has been undertaking a range of polls for all our panelists, uh, all our panels from the last uh, six weeks. And last week, the poll was on gender and the topics of interest as voted by you. They're on, up on the screen right now, so please participate in our polls uh, and please provide feedback. We welcome them and uh, we try and engage, use them into, into our next uh, panelist. But uh, it's my honor right now to introduce Hector Hatch. He's been a teacher, assistant, and deputy principal in New Zealand and Fijian schools for the past 32 years, so over three decades. He did his primary and secondary schooling in Lotoka and Suva. He's an uh, ex-grammar. He studied Bachelor of Agricultural Economics and a Master's of Education at Massey University in New Zealand. He's a graduate diploma in theology from the Bible College of New Zealand. He's represented Fijian athletics and coached uh, New Zealand and Fijian school athletes uh, uh, on cross country. His favorite memories are of teaching at Ratu Kandavu Levu School 
and he is currently, as I mentioned earlier, the deputy principal of International School Suva. Uh, wide range of experience, Mr. Hatch. Uh, Stanley, and um, thank you, everybody. Um, what an honor to be here today. Um, I, I'm reminded of a proverb which says that um, the land will be healed when the hearts of the fathers are turned to the hearts of the sons. And um, I think that that talks that speaks to me highly of um, education because um, there's a couple of things in that. Um, one of it is that um, the land will be healed. So we're talking about nation building. We're talking about the benefit to a nation. And so when I think of education, um, as Dr. Gallander said, it's much more than just the result of, on a piece of paper. It is actually about the future of a country. It's about nation building. Um, and the other part, of course, is uh, where the hearts of the fathers, I think we're talking about two different generations. And so when one generation who is responsible turns and considers the needs of the second generation, of the, the upcoming generation, then we can see real progress and real healing in our nation. Um, and so as an educator, both as a Fiji citizen and as an international educator, I'm obliged um, to, to ensure, to look carefully at the delivery um, and the makeup or the construction of education in our country, in fact, in every country. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that I need to consider when I look at that. I think, how does the makeup of our education system, how does the delivery of our education support our children? Or even more than that, how does it threaten their future? And so in some ways, that's where I come from. Um, in a recent, uh, on the um, Ministry of Education, Heritage and Arts website, you'll find a document there which is uh, from UNESCO. It's the um, September 29 document, 2019, sorry, document. And it speaks of engagement or rather disengagement of children around the world. And the statistics, pretty horrifying. 258 million children are disengaged from education. That's school-aged children. Um, some of it is beyond our control. We've seen recently with COVID, for three months, our children have been, by and large, disengaged. Um, and of course, that, that is an external thing, not the fault of anybody. However, my job is to look at those things in education that cause disengagement. Um, we've mentioned some of that already. And I guess one of the things, I, I do acknowledge, you know, there are moves and there has been work to try to engage our children. There's been policies and strategies, the Strat Plan for 2019 to 2023 on the, um, that the government has put forward. Um, that has some amazing things in the Strat Plan. The difficulty is the operationalization of that Strat Plan, delivering it in the classroom, empowering people and connecting with what is needed. We, we, we often speak about a 21st century uh, mode of teaching. Uh, I prefer to think of a 22nd century mode because that's my, my children's, sorry, my grandchildren's grandchildren. And so I have a responsibility also to my grandchildren's grandchildren. And so when I think of the 22nd century learning style or mode of teaching, we are not there. We are still operating out of an industrial model, which is a 19th century mode of teaching. That industrial model, the, the idea behind that is a just-in-case kind of model. So what that tells us is you try to cram as much as you can just in case you need that information. Unfortunately, information today goes out of date within a week or within two weeks. And so while you're learning it, it has already become out of date. And so education, a 21st or 22nd century education, is about a just-in-time scenario. So what does that mean for us practically? What it means is that we need access and we, to everything that's around us so that we can make clever, responsive decisions just in time for when we need it. COVID came unexpectedly. We showed that we have the capacity to react just in time. But we also saw that in many cases, 
we weren't prepared. Because all the knowledge that we had that wasn't applicable to these changes suddenly became useless. I have the privilege, my wife and I have the a real privilege of um, looking after, since COVID, we, we um, have some people who live in the settlement just down the road from us. And um, we started off with one young lady, who, a young girl, who, um, young nine girl, who wanted to keep learning. She wanted to stay engaged. So we started with her. And um, in the afternoon, we just spent a little bit of time working with her. Then another child came in. Now we have six children who want to be engaged. Now when they first came in, they sat down and they were used, you could tell they were used to sitting down and expecting the expert to tell them the answers. We don't operate like that. So we had to say to them, don't be embarrassed. We're going to work on this together. Last night we um, enjoyed six of them and, um, just recently. But what's happening now is those kids are just opening up and you are seeing their natural talents and their natural instinct instincts to learn and to be creative. And they're coming up with all sorts of different ways to explain things. Um, and so part of the threat is the rote learning industrial model that we have. The next question I guess that um, comes from that is, if that's the case, how do we operationalize or how do we put in place among, in our system, in our schooling system, how do we put in place and empower our teachers to be free to operate this? We need to move away from a heavily compliant, reliant model. So something where we are told, as Dr. Gander said, something where our teachers are told what to teach, how to teach, and um, focused on an exam. Okay, that won't cut it. What needs to happen is we need to empower our teachers to be creative and to teach the children how to be creative, how to be inquirers. So if a question is asked, so why is the answer like that, um, say in math? The answer should never be, that's because that's the rule. That is a perfect opportunity to enter into a partnership with a child and to, teach and to lead that child to an inquiry in terms of why that is the case. And so we have amongst us a lot of natural instinct, a lot of natural um, ability to do that. One of the um, qualities, I guess, to develop the responsiveness is in the resources around us. Okay, I think we need to trust ourselves as Fijians. We need to trust ourselves because we are navigators. The, the dispositions and the attitudes are those things and the skills are those things we need to nurture. Um, we were navigators who came to this land. And nobody told the first navigators who came to Fiji what it would be like, COVID, post-COVID situation. Okay? Nobody knows what it's like on the other end. Um, we'd be resilient. After a hurricane, we don't give up. After cyclones, we don't give up. After COVID, we don't give up. We know how to look after ourselves because we are a collaborative people. We are people who naturally work together. And so that sort of inquiry, that sort of model of education, if that is delivered, if that's the style that we have in all our schools, we will find that the motivation of our children, the willingness of our community to connect and for engagement to happen will multiply. I think of the different um, organizations around the place and, um, and the different resources we have. I was talking to a lady yesterday who's from Vivia and uh, she was saying how they are the um, first certified organic island in Fiji. What an amazing thing. You know, that is innovation. Nobody told them that they had to go fishing all the time or they had to go diving all the time. They decided to go beyond that and create innovation and this is a world-class concept. And so we can lead the world in that. Um, Justin Hunter, a few episodes ago, was talking about the blue economy. We have a blue economy all around us. We look at our, um, our people on the farms. Uh, when I was at RKS, I wanted to learn how to plant ndalo using ndoko. 
And uh, because I had no idea how, I used to use a digging fork and my dialo was about that big. I was shown actually in a dream how to cut and use ndoko. I did that and my ndalo ended up that big. And so those traditional knowledge and the traditional technologies and so on, um, they are appropriate. What we need to do is we need to contextualize through community consultation. Let's get in all the international ideas. They're awesome, but let's contextualize it because if we don't, then we will miss the mark. It's all very well to have ideas, um, say, with technology. However, we can't all afford technology, but we can all afford to walk out to the ocean. Um, at the moment, they're in the social science curriculum, so here's another thing that I would suggest we address, and we have the opportunity to reset, is to look at the curriculum and the curriculum documents or resources that we use. One of the um, social science um, aspects of the curriculum in Fiji is oceans and rivers literacy. What an awesome initiative. However, I do have a little bit of a, a um, concern around that, and that is because it is textbook driven. Um, Nandan, Mr. Nandan from FNU wrote a good analysis on that, where you know our children in schools, they have a textbook. A lot of them may struggle a little bit with English as a first language. Putting a textbook in front of them on the oceans and rivers deprives them of the knowledge of our ancestors, deprives them of the knowledge of our fathers and mothers. And so the connection between our fathers and mothers and education is missed. The land will not be healed if that continues. It will continue to disengage. Um, you know, that all that is needed is for a walk down to the rivers with someone who is using the rivers, who knows about the need and the importance of conserving that river and that ocean. You know, that's all that is needed to contextualize what comes through in terms of the education plans and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm a believer in, in our people. Uh, just recently I had the opportunity to interview a young lady, um, she would have been about 25, a young teacher from one of our local schools. This was actually pre-COVID. And she was awesome. She had, on her own initiative, set up a Viber group, including the parents and including the principal of the school and the students. And she was accessible to them at quite a few different times. And all of a sudden, instead of being in the classroom, these students were asking all sorts of inquiry and deep thinking questions. They were not embarrassed to ask those questions because it was one-on-one -on -one through Viber. And then all of a sudden, the other students would start responding. And that collaboration and that inquiry is exactly what we need to prepare ourselves for a future that's coming to Fiji, that's coming very soon because the new normal is already here. Naka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hatch, and uh, I have some burning questions, but I understand that someone has a burning question from the audience. We'll take that question. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rosie Emerson Samisi. Uh, I'm a fashion consultant, a designer, and also an educator. Uh, thank you for those presentations. I'm, I, I will speak. I'll just make a comment. I'm not asking a question. On the uh, creative industries, uh, we're talking about um, education here, and I think um, my journey within, in the creative arts uh, have also shown the need for training and upskilling education in that area for our members. Uh, I will just speak, I will just make a comment on the, the, the creative industries in the sense that it's never been fully appreciated like how it is now. Um, after pandemic, a lot of people turn to the, uh, to the creative industries to create things so they're able to sell and sustain their families and themselves. Uh, for me, uh, working with the um, artisans in fashion and in the craft, and also with the visual artists, uh, we've seen the need. Uh, it's never been so urgent like now, and the need starts from the classroom. Uh, when we talk about the uh, creative arts, uh, we've been talking about it for the last how many years? A, a long, long time. But this, I think, we've been taken seriously now. People are listening to us. Uh, we, uh, we need to have the fashion and design um, you know, incorporated into the school curriculum urgently. Uh, we need to also look at introducing or reintroducing the visual arts from primary school as well. 
uh, and also the craft. Uh, Dr. Thomas, when he talked about film, um, you know, introducing and, and, and getting people to learn from the um, secondary schools and also from the primary schools, um, we also need to look at the creative industries. Um, that is lacking, and we've been talking about it, and we will continue to, um, to, you know, to make submissions and continue to make noise in that area. But it's very important that we, the creative industry or the creative arts industry is also considered when it comes to education. Um, I'm holding in my hand, there was a um, finding, um, a paper that was done in 1999, and it talks about um, creating education and, and, and also providing uh, training or education that it's of relevance. Very, very important. Uh, for us in the creative industries, we, we look at relevance, we look at the revision, and also the redevelopment of school curriculum. So our creative arts is also considered for it as part of the education system now. Um, there's been a lot of talk. There was also um, recommendations done over the years uh, by very uh, you know, uh, well-known organizations, the UNDP, UNESCO, and also our, our academics here in Fiji but nothing has been realized. And, and what I'm asking is, we've worked with the creative, uh, with the artisans, and we know their needs. In the past, they've been ignored. Uh, but what happened now is, after the pandemic, after the um, uh, COVID, people have come out, they've, you know, they've come out and they're creating things to sell. There's so many markets popping out all over the place. So um, even on uh, social media, people are also s entertaining, singing and writing music and you know, performing through TikTok. We, we have a lot of uh, talent out there. So what I'm, uh, what I'm saying is, um, you know, for the people out there, um, you know, the powers uh, you know, that can make it happen, uh, please consider the creative arts and, and, and they need to, to be considered when it comes to decision making in, in education through training and upskilling. Um, when, we, when the PM wanted, or when he wanted to tell our story on an international platform at COP23 to 25, who did they take? They took entertainers. They didn't take any doctors, they didn't take any lawyers, they took entertainers. When we wanted to retell our story at festivals around the Pacific and in the world, who did they take? Who did Fiji take to tell our stories? The arts, okay? Um, tourism, we're very much part and parcel of the tourism industry. When people Come to when the visitors come into our to Fiji and in the Pacific, okay, they you know they have they've been given a, a beautiful package. But when they come here, in order for the tourism industry to fulfill their obligations in that package, they have to have entertainment. They they invite the uh, the artisans uh, through entertainment, through food, uh, makeup, hair, all those things. So we are very much part of development in any society. So what we are saying is. You know, we want to be taken seriously. We, uh, I'm a partner in the Creative Arts VT that's just been formed, and uh, we, we have a place in uh, my FNPF. We have a place provided for our artisans, our craft ladies, and our visual artists and fashion designers to come and sell. So we are looking at those kind of incentives or initiatives so we're able to, to progress. So I'm just making a comment, um, you know, following Larry's um, contribution into the arts. It's very, very important that we are taken seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Great point. Uh, I think uh, let's match in with what the previous uh, presenters, uh, uh, panelists have, have mentioned. And we'll come back to some questions for you, uh, Mr. Hatch, uh, later. I'd like to now bring in uh, Ufemia Vamaitonga, who is our next panelist. She's an author, an early childhood care and education consultant and the National President of Fiji Early Childhood Teachers Association. Uh, she currently works as a consultant facilitator uh, in early childhood care and education uh, for USP Pacific TAFE. She's actively engaged with forging early childhood partnerships across organizations and people, and she's also a grandmother of five grandsons, Ufemia. Thank you, Stanley. I like that. Grandmother, five beautiful boys. But unfortunately, I don't have any granddaughter. But nevertheless, these boys do keep me on the go. Thank God two of them are out overseas, and the rest are here in Fiji. Um, just going back to, uh, I'd like to um, join force with Larry and the other speakers, Hector. The creativity, the arts. 
we need to really move beyond traditional boundaries in teaching and learning with young children. And this re what does this require? It requires a shift in mindset, in attitudes, in the way we do things. We're talking about, uh, Mr. Hatch had just talked about the industrial model that is pretty outdated. Where is all the creativity that our Fiji children are born with? You don't have to teach them to go and play rugby. You don't have to teach them to hold a, a pen. You don't even have to teach them to sing and do a meke. And now it's coming from the floor. Because all these things come out naturally without, from our own children if they are given the opportunity to do so in the environment. So, I would like to focus my talk this morning is to refocus. Let's do things, not the traditional way. Let's take learning to the homes. And I'm talking about here a home-based education care model. This COVID-19, and I say thank goodness it has come because it has pushed the care component to the forefront of teaching and learning in early childhood care and education. And not only in early childhood, we need to start young, but in others as you, they go up the ladder. Um, every 20 seconds, wash your hands uh, and all those strict hygiene uh, protocols, social distancing and all that. We need to teach them from young. My little grandson who goes to, um, there's two of them, one is at home, one goes to year one. He is forever washing his hands with soap and water. And then one day his mother said to him, you are going to finish up our soap. And he said, I'm washing my hands. And then from there it goes to the hand sanitizer. So, okay, that's good. But these are the children that have been provided for. I'm talking about, what about the children, the disadvantaged, the unreached, that don't have access to water, to food, and all that. And that's what the COVID, that's the other stress um, mentality that this COVID has come up. It has brought stress out onto the parents who cannot simply put food on the table. And um, all the other basic things in life. So what do I mean about taking home, taking uh, early childhood education to the homes? I'm talking about Offering, when you take home-based care to the homes, this is what I saw. I saw this model in Auckland. Uh, you are strengthening the parents, the families, and the communities. And you empower them. You know, reprioritize your lives, your, your roles as parents. They are the first teachers. Let's acknowledge that. We don't have any two ways about it, but they are the first thing. So we need to really empower them and engage them. So what we see now is the drop in schools, and this means drops in I mean, children going to school for obvious reasons and the drop in staffing. So why don't we take the school to the children or communities or villages and as centers of learning where you can have at least um, a qualified teacher, put them into this home-based education, and of course, we'd like government to continue to pay them if they're qualified that they need to pay them. And also, you get an assistant teacher, which could be one of the family members, parents, grandmother, or aunt, and train them also in the care and education of this. I saw this running very well in the homes that I visited in Auckland. But further to that, they also need to have the resources and the finances maybe to help them start get off the ground. And that's where, you know, government comes in. Although we might say, oh yes, they have this, uh, we're paying them, we're uh, giving them tuition. Can we kindly transfer those tuition to the home-based education? Then we will have less and less of this stress and frustrations that is going on now in our fa with our families that are suffering or suffocated by the, the uh, effects of COVID-19. 
And the sciences have proved that. That play is therapeutic. Because when you take them, you will see more of children playing naturally in their home environment, in their own natural environment. So, what are we trying to do? But we, are, we seem to be seeing, even before prior to um, COVID-19, we seem to be getting less and less of play in the, in the education system, in the early childhood education centers. Less and less play and more and more data worksheets. And now with the COVID in, we, okay, online learning, virtual learning, okay, more worksheets coming. Where is the creativity coming in? Where's the creative arts that comes in that is normally fostered and encouraged at early childhood, during early childhood? So what I really think that what we are all talking about here is that we need to take this back to the homes and back to early childhood care and education. So when we, I just want to give an example of what we did at Pacific TAFE. When COVID came, our students were just ready to go out for workplace attachment to the centers. And then quickly we had to work out something, an innovative plan to say, okay, they have to complete, it was compulsory to complete those hours of work. work. Otherwise they would not graduate. So we came up with three options. Option one is there was no need to go out with you know, we took away the center-based care. You have a choice. Observe your own child at home. Work with your own child at home. This is 14 weeks, you know. And the option two was you could do that, work with another, uh, with your relative or parents, another friend's son, a child. And option three, you could work with another colleague. Now, that was a bit of a struggle for our students, you know, changing from the mentality center-based, this is the way it's done, and then to home-based care and education. On three occasions, through our Viber, I had set up a Viber uh, group with my students, so they were talking to me, and I was able to gauge that they were lost. So on three occasions, I had to call them in to talk about how they could go about it, and it was much more simple than they thought. But it was enhancing, empowering, and working better with the parents. So, but the feedback that we got from these students, I just want to say a few here. We saw that students came up with more creative ways of learning. For example, observing and play with children in the creeks. Them observing parents, or observing them themselves taking their own children out to the creeks. Climbing stairs, something that they never, some of them never thought about. Bathing washing, even use of bathroom, um, joining in during the laundry times, having meals together, running around their backyard, climbing trees, setting up a vegetable garden, washing cars, attending to family cultural activities, etc. They were real lived experiences. So it was bringing that, nurturing that back into the children, into the families of these uh, children. So parents, students, and families definitely refocused their home agendas and spending more quality time together. It was not for this, if it was not for this innovation or intervention, I might say, we certainly will have a play deficient and nature deficient environments or communities, and this is what we would like to prevent. Um, that was, you know, 40 weeks. So what does this lead to? Strengthening and engagement with parents, and I think it has come up here with our previous speakers, with families, and, and how do we do that? We train them in, you can, you train them in good child rearing practices. For example, positive discipline. With the stress that parents are now on them, can't find food, where do I get the money to feed them next week and whatnot? Definitely, they would be stressed out. But this stress somehow is passed on to the children. So who would not be yelling at their children? Who will not be um, maybe giving a smack because they are not listening? Right? So uh, it needs to be 
Uh, this is where we also need to bring in the child protection. And child protection policy in, within, it's a no-no, zero, zero policy. So child abuse is zero policy. So they have a very strong child policy, but we need to reactivate. And I just want us to emphasize it. This is where we can adopt and promote the play-based program again, right? Strengthen it. It's happening in, so, in the schools, but not enough. It's diminishing, if you ask me, because of, well, we cannot, um, we cannot really blame the teachers because of the system. You know, we have this uh, SDG 4, where you want all the children at f uh, age of five to learn this, 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 this standardizing as so as if that's a one size fit all um, school. We need to move away from it. We need to go younger. Please go back to the three, four-year-olds that we, are, we tend to miss. That's in the policy, but somehow that has been lost, and the focus now is only on the five-year-olds out there in the system. So I just want to go, um, just say here, when children play, more simply playing, it's more simply than playing, during this times, play, children are learning valuable skills that meet the social, cognitive, physical development, as well as exploring areas that interest them. It appeals to children so, and to their holistic development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ufemia. And uh, some really, really great points uh, there. And uh, you mentioned about playing and giving more playing time. Well, we now someone, have someone who knows about playing. Uh, Sarah Mayambai. He hails from uh, Sueni in the Conrove, uh, but he was born and bred uh, in Nandali. No, sorry, that's why a lot of people think he's from Tailevu. Bai is a former Fiji National 15s rugby player. He's one of Fiji's great rugby experts with a pro professional rugby career spanning over 16 years. He is the founder of Rugby Academy Fiji and a farmer who, established, who has established Bai Agro Rugby Farm. Sermon Bai. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a uh, privilege to be, to be here and, and when I'm among uh, academics, uh, you know, people, uh, I don't, it, it, it seems like it's intimidating for me because of my, probably my level of education and, and uh, the level of my English. Um, you can ask why sports or rugby got to do with education. But uh, rugby uh, taught me so much about life. Uh, I must commend uh, too that we're talking about system, but we should be very thankful for all the teachers of Fiji from you know from over the years because we have produced some of the professors, some of the pilots, some of the you know, important people that are not only employed here in Fiji, they've previously passed on, retired, and living in overseas. They were educated in a local uh, education system. They educated from a sugarcane field, from a rice field, from the village in the highlands. So we should uh, commend you guys for doing such a, a very difficult task with, with the system in place, and you do change lives and give hopes to our, our generation. Um, during, uh, I normally visit uh, uh, schools uh, around uh, Fiji just to, to, to talk to students about rugby. Uh, I think 2018, I, I finished my career in 2016 after 16 years of playing professionally and decided to come back. But 2018, when I visit around schools, um, some stats that I, I pulled out from the internet about, uh, our, I mean, the s s statistics was, uh, I, I don't know whether you guys know that in 2015-16, statistic of uh, youth unemployment survey was 18%. And in, in 2013, Fiji recorded about 15,000 unemployed youths. Early, in, I mean, in, in 2018, about uh, 1,500 teenage pregnancy girls 58 of those was 15 years old. 
juvenile youth um, crime rate was about 28,000. School dropouts from year 8 to 16,000. And year th 13 was about 7,000. Probably uh, my statistic, because I got it from the internet, but it, uh, it's because of the system as well. You know, you have bullying, you have suicide. That's all come from schools and the, and the communities. When uh, I always said this to students, they always laughed, you know. And I always tell them, you know, the reality is some of you or some may be listening right now, um, you can add up to that statistic at the end of your uh, schooling. So the question is, how, how can you survive that? Like, how can you achieve your goal? How can you have hope in life in, in that situation? Because I think whether you come through an education system, whether you, uh, you at work or whatever, or drop out of school, I think the end result of the outcome is to get an income, for you to, to get a job and, and be successful in life. The, the, the thing that I want to touch base on, on my talks is the life that rugby gave me and rethink, rethinking sports as an industry or career. Just to talk about a little bit of my, my, my life journey was um, I dropped out of school when I was 14. So I failed the system or the system failed me. Um, I, I was a single parent most of my life, uh, but I know my father uh, later on. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love my father with all my heart. I for, you know, forgave them, I mean him. Um, so I failed the education system and even life, so I don't have any hope, just like any other kids. You know, I spend uh, three years in the village and then you know, come back and, and attend from six, just because of rugby. But three years in the village, it's, it gives me a foundation to refocus, probably what we're having right now. Uh, and then when I attend that opportunity came, I, I took it with both hands. And I think the, even though I didn't go through the education system, but life was my lesson life lesson. So the things that I do, I, I make sure, I think um, some things that I, I apply in my life was, was values that I think a lot of people forget about life values is, is important. I think uh, I changed the mindset. I think when I, when I come back, uh, attended secondary school, um, and then after that, there's an opportunity that I, I came in, in 1999 and 2000, uh, make it to the national uh, level, and then I spent 16 years overseas. I just retired in 2016. So sports, I mean rugby, uh, it taught me a lesson. Like with rugby, um, I managed to to achieve my, my goal. You know, I, I used to remember when I always come with the USP student, I always hide. Because I, I always thought that you know, only USP students are smart. And, and I always hide. When I was running, I always hide. And um, now that um, I can say that we, we have different pathways. Uh, it's maybe in sports, it may be in the education system. I remember I used to say, you know, Mark Twain said, never, never allow your schooling to interfere with your education. Because I always say to the, the kids in, in my shoes, they said, you know, um, education doesn't mean you have to go to school. You know, edu education is by reading books, you know, cooking, like drama, you know, things like that. That's you, educa you, you self educate yourself. You, you gotta change, I think, change the mindset. And, uh, you know, rugby taught me that. You know, I remember because, uh, you know, you're coming from the village, you're coming in a traditional village, you know, the system. 
So in terms of uh, what is mentioned before, you know, it uh, take away the, the, um, the creativity and, uh, and thinking of, uh, of uh, children. You know, the system was, you know, parents or fathers, you know, I speak, you listen. So you don't have to say or with your opinion to, to share with, with your parents. And I was thinking, oh, how cool is that? And then later on, when, when I become a parent, and I totally changed that. And even as a husband and wife, you know, the, 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 the women do all the, the work. If they want to say a thing, the same thing happens. You know, you speak, you know, I speak and you listen. So, and when, uh, when I came back 2016, and this is a, a reason why I came back, because I, I was one of the, you know, the kids who didn't do well in school. So those statistics, I said, what, you know, why can't I do that? Why, you know, what's the reason of staying in overseas and, and a good living? I know the, the, you know, the privilege of staying there and comfortable living. But I said, I'm, I'm going to go and, and try something. So a vision to start an, a rugby academy, but for people in a rugby sense, they only say when it's academy, it's, um, it's where you develop potential and elite rugby players. For, you know, for, for myself, I always call it, it's an environment, you know, where you groom all these, these players. That's the beauty of uh, team sports or rugby. When they huddle each other, when they, in their jersey, in their shorts, socks, and their rugby boots, you didn't even know that one of those players, they drop out of school. They come from the broken family. Because we are all equal in that sense. So when, uh, when I started that, there's a, you know, I got a kids club from five um, to 13 and then the, the, the older ones. The reason why I do that is trying to teach values in, in, into kids. You know, we trying for them, even though you try and develop their rugby skills, but on the, on the other note, you're trying to teach them about values that you can apply to, to your life. And the, the older ones is, is that there's, a, there's other students we teach them about trying to get education and rugby. So currently we have about 20 students are overseas through rugby scholarships. So 10 in, in Japan through four years of studying, four years, and then, um, and then rugby. So imagine you elevate poverty, you give them an opportunity in life. Um, so, and, and the other ones are in New Zealand, including a girl, you know, earning a scholarship and set a platform for them to achieve in life. For me, is the, the vision behind this is, even though they, they don't do well in school, even though, you know, broken family, whatever reason, the vision was, I want to mold these, these kids to, to become, you know, I always tell parents and, and students when they, they call me and want to, to be recruited, they always say, I want to be a rugby player, I want to play for Fiji, I want to get a scholarship or, or, or contract overseas. I said, the, um, probably the, the priority is, that's not the first priority. The first priority we want to, to mold here, we want you to just to become a good person, good people, because the reality is, only one person can make it. That's reality. We are not only the, the rugby players that play, that want, you know, that club. You know, there's players from overseas as well. So we want to mold them into to, to good men so they become good husbands. They become, you know, better men um, in the future. So when you align that with education and rugby, a good example is this. COVID came. No rugby at all. What you gonna left with? What you gonna do? So what we did is we're trying to implement agriculture. So I'm thinking from post-career wise, which a lot of us don't think of. 
you know, we, we struggle as, as former rugby player. When, when you finish your career, if you don't have uh, academic qualification, you will struggle. So if you come back to Fiji. So, you know, every, lots of, uh, you know, indigenous Fijian, the access to their land. So we're trying to teach them in a way to try not only, you know, plant their own food for their family, and then you can sell it and do it as a business. Because a lot of um, our stars, we, I mean, a lot of our rugby players, we don't do well in school. The only thing we go to school. Right over the years, you see um, students just attend school to play rugby. So how do we fix that? How do we fix the school dropouts? Can we, that's, that's the questions for, you know, you guys probably in a better place, you've been in the system for so long, policy makers. Um, so those, those are the things that I've tried and, and come back and, and do it. Because rugby can be a social development in our country. You know? Because uh, people look up to rugby players, you know, even kids. You know, we're supposed to be role models. So, you know, we can empower communities. So for us, is even if you don't make it, at least you can go to arts. You can go to writing. You know, you, you can go maybe, uh, you know, a coach. Even if you didn't go through the school system. So we, we need something in place to, to cater these school dropouts because the percentage, it's going to grow. I think when I went to Fiji Higher Education, uh, they told me about a research that 20,000 students, they cater from year, year 9s to year 13s. So they, they track them. By the time they reach uh, year 13, I think uh, only 7,000 graduate. So imagine it's going to be year after year. I think when post-COVID came, I did the rugby and agriculture together, you know. Um, just because the, we have natural resources, which is the land. We just need to be educated how to use it properly, how to make money out of it. Because I've been seeing, when I was in overseas, everybody wants to go overseas, but we didn't realize and appreciate the natural resources we have. We have a lot of uh, people from overseas that are setting up business here that probably we didn't see and appreciate what, what we have here. And um, something that we, I think we, we've been trying to, to instill in, in the academy, and I think the, the, probably what we do not being taught in school, and what I, I feel, we were struggling, most of our rugby players struggle when they have, have it in, in overseas, is um, time management, um, the value of money, and the culture of savings. So those are the things that um, we've been trying to, to, um, to try and teach them. But for us, it's not all about rugby, you know, playing rugby. We're just using rugby as a tool. We, we get them, attract them, and then we try and teach them, and so they can be empowered. One of the, the innovation that we did post-COVID was our online kids clinic, virtual learning, I mean, virtual training clinic. Well, we, every, every Wednesdays and uh, Fridays, we did it on Facebook. Uh, thanks to Milo, who've been uh, kindly supporting us. So we did, uh, you know, it's, it's just for the kids to move and have fun. There's a bit of music. And parents are welcome to, to, um, to join in. And, um, yeah, that's, that's probably, you know, it's, I'm not something that... Uh, I've heard or, you know, I've read. I was one of the person that, you know, threw the, the, the system. system. The, and then I broken system. But I, I find my way through, you know. But one encouragement I want to do is, like, you know, even the rugby players, if you're not in an academy or you're not in the high honors, but it doesn't guarantee anybody that you'll make it to the professional. Because most of us that make it to the... The national team didn't come through the Dean's uh, um, system. Thank you. Yeah. Great points there, and I think uh, 
uh, by Sir Man, by I think the definition of uh, education and how we make it all encompassing, and also about the engagement, the way we engage, uh, create uh, an, 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 an education environment that allows for exchange and allows to nurture everyone's individual talent as opposed to what we may call that industrial era education system that we had. I will take time now for any questions uh, and comments. Please make it brief, introduce yourselves, and uh, I'll take two questions, uh, three questions at uh, one time, and ask the panelists to respond. Uh, Please keep it short and to the point. Eh? Yeah, Bula, Bula everyone, my name is Mukesh, and I'm one of the founders at Acton. Uh, my question to the panelists today is based, uh, two questions. Uh, the number one being, uh, do you feel that the current way we are educating children fully prepares them for the needs of the world today? Um, the reason I ask that is because I feel education is perhaps the most anti-technical, technological aspect of our society today, and uh, we are actually getting uh, the same at a higher and higher price. Uh, and this is not actually me saying, uh, I, there are statistics that say that 45% of millennials uh, feel that education today does not meet their needs and they are actually re re resolving towards other needs like online, right? A uh, great example, again, Facebook was also mentioned. Um, so the reason that I believe that is the case is because I think the three main reasons. One, we are not incentivizing and we are decentivizing. A great example is uh, in schools today, if a child is late, they are asked to pick up rubbish because, uh, just because of something human that you are actually late. So why, why do that? Um, another example uh, is basically in uh, universities today, there is 100 level, 200 level, 300 level courses. Uh, if you are a 100 level student and you feel that you, you feel confident enough to do a 200 level course, you can't do that today, right? Why? Uh, so those are the things I think uh, need to change, and I'd like to uh, hear your uh, opinions on those set of things. And uh, I also feel that education has become a competition, and there is no room for empathy and failure, something that's very human, right? And uh, like, uh, 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 like Mr. Bai mentioned, uh, that if you fail in your class, then you are actually looked down upon. Why do we do that? Why not? Uh, incentivize in some way so that uh, we can actually learn much more. Uh, so as an example, uh, when I was in primary school, my favorite subject used to be math. Uh, and uh, 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 when I reached secondary school, I actually thought that uh, some of the things that I learned there wasn't uh, actually going to help me in the future. So I would have liked to have a choice to, there to say that uh, maybe uh, uh, that's something that I don't want to consider. Uh, doing for going forward. Uh, the other question. Uh, Sorry, I I'll think just, uh, we'll, we'll probably leave that. Yeah. I think there's quite a bit of questions you've given there. Yeah. Uh, I'll, before I get to the, any other questions from the. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, panelists, and thank you, organizers, for having uh, the, giving me the opportunity to be here. Colleagues, I am Govind Singh. Uh, I work as Secretary General for Council of Pacific Education, that is a branch for Education International in the region. But back at home, I am managing a couple of schools, so I am in the thick of uh, management issues and uh, uh, social issues and other things in the school. I am also the founding president of School Management Association of Fiji. Um, Dr. Nilesh had touched ground when he spoke about issues um, relating to management and stakeholders and partnership and the fact that 98% of the schools in the country belong to either faith-based organizations or independent communities. It is through their wisdom that these schools exist, which of course caters in terms of accessibility, uh, availability uh, of schools to the children. Um, we have had difficulties in the recent past in terms of management issues, in terms of funding issues, of course. And uh, now that COVID-19 is there, you know, other serious factors that compound and make things difficult. Of course, the reforms have taken place, but reforms have not taken into account 
the fact that there are managements who do this work out of philanthropy, out of passion, out of voluntarism to ensure that their schools are best in and offer quality education to our children. Some of our people who founded their schools may not have been educated in formal sense, but they had the wisdom that community provided at that time to found schools in this country. In the current climate, we have lost uh, ground in terms of partnership, in terms of collaboration with the stakeholders, genuine social dialogue, and there are too many unilateral decisions that we are faced with. So I would like the panelists to throw some light on how we could reignite that partnership, that philanthropy, that synergy that exists in the community and in our people and in our management, which, you know, which is a testimony that they own 98% of the schools in the country. Thank you. Great Thank question. You. Great question. I'll take another, another question. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Shirley from Suva. I just wanted to connect to what uh, Larry said and what Hector also added as well about learning in fear. And I wanted to delve into it, uh, just recalling ever since we we're in primary school, um, cramming. Uh, in the English book, this is Tom, this is Anna, come here Tom, come here Anna. I'm 46 and I still remember that. But that was in a class one, a class one uh, subject. But I wanted to also link it to the, um, at that, that stage in, um, in the education system whilst we're learning, the, lear the f learning in fear. Uh, where kids are also having to, uh, there are learning disabilities, there's dyslexia, there's also issues of poverty that contribute to the, fearing, uh, the, the fear of learning. Um, your sexual orientation, gender identity throughout the whole education system, uh, violence within the family. So one of the things that also stood, I, I wanted to highlight that. The other thing that stood out for me was also the encouragement of critical thinking that is not available within the education system. Uh, a space to think about thinking. And I, I loved the examples that you did, Larry. Um, I think. One thing that is very interesting for me is the difference between... Sorry, Shelley, do you have a question? Yes, okay. getting Can there. we get to it? Then? Public and state learning as opposed to private school learning. And I know, Hector, you come from the uh, private uh, schools. One of the... My, yes. Sorry? Yes, and state. But I think right now, currently, you with uh, International Secondary School. Uh, others as well can also answer this. How can uh, introducing creativity and pushing the boundaries? Yes, but what does that look like and how can our state education curriculum learn from private schools learning and what can the private schools share uh, recommendations, lessons learned to help build uh, the public uh, schools learning? Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Really great questions. And I think uh, we'll start from you, Larry. I think great. <laughs> A uh, great question about uh, the millennials, so to speak, who now don't see education as connecting with them. And, you know, the, the culture of fear. Great example of the coming to school late and uh, being punished for it. Eh? Uh, and uh, the question from uh, maybe the last the question from uh, Govind on the, how do we reignite that passion? Because that's what's driving of the faith based schools and community schools in the country. And of course, we'll come to Hector on the other points and the rest of the panelists, uh, Larry. Thank you, Stan. Um, great questions from all of you. Um, uh, because you, you prefaced your question uh, with a very long um, introduction, I'm trying to remember. It basically is, you know, does the school system prepare us? And the answer is no, um, for, for various reasons. And I think when I talked about fear, and, and it's interesting that Shirley talks about that because I think a lot of us, particularly, and, and Euphemia will, will confirm that, you know, at those early years, um, it, it stays with you. you know, the, uh, the, the way you were, you were taught, what you learned, those first 10 years are really integral in, in your learning. Um, and, uh, and of course, it, it doesn't stop there. When you're from primary and from secondary school, it, this fear continues simply because um, our, well, our, our cultural, traditional ways of learning, I think, contribute 
you know, um, to that, that fear. It's, it's because, and I think uh, Sarah Maya also mentioned, it's, you know, we talk, you listen. And it doesn't change. And unless you're a strong individual to go against the grain, you'll just be stuck with the, like the majority of many students who continue to live in fear. And you, you succeed, and I think the, the, to succeed, you just have to be an individual who has the courage and the guts to say, I want to be different and I'm going to pursue this. Unfortunately, most people don't because we, we, we conform to the norms and the way society wants us to be. Um, and so, of course, uh, with, with the question of Govind and, and also Shirley, it's, it's the system. And unless we change the system, we, we'll continue with, with very much the same as we're going now. So, yes, we can, we can talk about it until, you know, the moon turns blue, but we have to get the buy-in of, of government, you know, and not of all, it's, it's, you know, the past governments also. You know, we can't lay the blame on any, any one particular government. It's the past government, yeah. you know, pre-independence and post-independence. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Um, reigniting the system. Because the one thing about talking about the system, but one thing is reigniting the passion and the community spirit. Yeah, I'll just briefly respond to the yeah, first, sure. first question as well. One of the greatest challenges with curriculum reform or development today is predicting about the future. So we're educating our children and adults in universities, assuming this is how the future is going to turn out to be. <clears throat> and as a result, if, if the future does not turn out the way we expect it to be, then there's always a mismatch between your skills and, and what you actually require in the workplace. And as the global economy is changing so quickly, it is very difficult to, to, to put a finger on how, how things are likely to happen. And that's one of the reasons for, for, for mismatch in terms of uh, your skills and what you're looking for in the labor market. And technology is also changing at a very fast, fast pace. So all this is creating a really challenging task uh, for in the last 20 years, and which is what I guess you refer to as, as the millennial uh, issue. <clears throat> Coming to, uh, to Govin's question, I think that's a very important question and, and I agree with him uh, on the issues that he has raised. Uh, uh, TSS Sangam is one of the largest uh, <coughs> uh, organizations in Fiji in terms of uh, ownership uh, management of schools. We have 26 schools in Fiji and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the great in innovations Fiji has seen in the last 100 years is the, the community state partnership and the spirit of community and the state coming together. <coughs> and we must continue with this spirit and this relationship must be strengthened. And if there are any issues that puts a dent or damages this relationship, it will only have an impact in terms of providing quality education uh, to our children. So it's very important for all stakeholders to be mindful of the fact that we need to work with each other. And, can, and can I just cut in? Can, can that partnership adapt and take us into the future? Yes, it can. I think we must realize that they're mutually beneficial outcomes uh, for, for, for all the, for, for the state and the community. So we need to, to, to respect the role and responsibilities of the community, community-run organizations, and the state as well. So it's about respect and understanding the responsibilities yeah. and, and consultation. I think that's really important. The last few years, I think one of the issues that has really put a dent into this relationship is lack of consultation. And I think if there's more, more consultation and we can talk to each other uh, face to face and we can uh, try to understand what, um, uh, what we are saying, I think that would be the best way to, 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 to forge ahead. And I think what the others are saying is uh, without that consultation, we see the gaps appearing. Eh? Uh, Mr. Hatch, if you, you comment on some of the points uh, raised by the questions. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll address the one regarding the fear, but also the place of the international schools that you were commenting on. Um, again, as I said in the beginning, education and schooling is about nation building. Okay, and um, one of the things about our nation which I think undergirds, this is a negative, that undergirds it, everything is our shame culture. Right? Because shame culture forces us into something and that forces us to hide uh, or to control. And, um, and so uh, to, to talk about the fear in a school, to remove that or to lessen and mitigate against that, I think 
I believe the most important thing is to build relational trust because that also builds the community spirit as well. And I think the re good relational trust is built on there's a number of pillars, four of them which I often like to think about when I'm developing um, relational trust with staff and communities. The first one, of course, is competence. If you are not competent in what you profess to be an expert in or profess to be engaged in, people might like you, but they're not going to respect your, your um, expertise in that area. Um, so I'll come back to competence in a minute. But I think in terms of engagement, there's also the need, another pillar for relational trust is respect. I like the origins of the word because it comes from the Latin respire, which is to do with spectacles and to look again. And so what needs to happen is for engagement to happen effectively, we all need to take a step back and look again. Don't assume we know all the answers that worked yesterday. They may not work today. And so respect for each other and for the communities is also a really important thing. It's one of the things I love about Fiji. We do have a foundation of respect. The other one is personal regard for each other. You know, we all come from different places, and we all been to different places, and um, we are all going to different places. And so we need to regard, have a personal, positive regard for each other. And, and I guess the key thing is integrity. You know, we do what we say. And um, if we don't like something, let's be clear about it. If we do love something, let's be clear about it. By building that relational trust, I think we can start working together. Now, the reason, reason I mention relational trust is because that has something to do with the relationship between our two international schools and the rest of our community. Um, that's why I'm really glad you asked that question, because I think we are misunderstood quite a bit. For example, um, international school in Nandi, they have a large proportion, as we do, of Itoke, and Fiji citizens as teachers. We have taken, um, and, and we also have our expatriate community, and they work beautifully together. At today, at the, um, the foundation of the international curriculum is a thing called CAS, Creativity, Action, and Service. And one of the things we, we do is to go out into our communities. We don't talk about it a lot, but I will show off about it today a little okay. bit to help you understand and connect. Um, we have classes going out, sorry, uh, students going out at the moment and feeding primary school children in the schools, in the primary schools. It's one of the things they do because that's the core of our international system. Another thing we do to engage and to spread how we do things, we are inquiry based. And so a big part of our curriculum is to draw pre-knowledge from students and then target them to things that they might want to learn about or that the community needs, the future might need, and get them to fill in the gaps through guiding them. We, we talk about the um, scribes on the side as teachers. So we sit on the side and we facilitate learning. To help get that out into the community, one of the uh, initiatives we have is, um, our head of primary, for example, we have an internship with our local, some of our local schools and teachers, and they come in when they are doing teacher training, and we help expose them to ideas, international ideas. It's also why it's very important that we have a good balance of our expatriate staff coming in. And the reason that that is vital to nation building in Fiji, I believe, because okay. we have that balance between our international and local. Okay, great okay. point. Uh, time has caught up on us. Um, and we'll now ask all the panelists to get, make their final points. Uh, I think for, for, for Mr. Mayer, like, you, know, you talked about the system failing you, or you failed the system. Uh, now that you've done, when you, have you gone to the education ministry and had the discussion about how you look about, look after those like you that may have fallen you know, on the long side, and the only thing keeping them back in school is rugby? How, how are you going to address that? And at the same time, round up your points so that we can finish off uh, today. Yeah. Uh, can you hold up the mic, please, with you? Sorry. Uh, I think it's um, if we can have so, some sort of a, a sports curriculum in, in school, because we don't have, just like arts, we don't have sports uh, curriculum in school, just to uh, keep the, the kids there, so they have the pathway from secondary school to FNU, I think the, the pathway for them is just straight to FNU. Um, so 
Um, yeah, that's, that's another path. And uh, th there's an academy that we can, you know, all the provinces can, can have for, uh, the, you know, the village, uh, the guys who are in the village who are dropouts that can cater and, and uh, just like technical college. But uh, work a curriculum that suits them, you know, uh, like farming as a business and enterprise. It seems like the, the, our education here, we go to school to work, to get a job. It's not like teaching us, go to school to start a business. So we have to change a little bit of a, of a mindset. And become a better person. Better, better person. And, and I think for, you know, through my, my, my experience with, with the rugby, that teaches me is, um, your, like my, the, the principles is more important than, than fame. You know, and, and values is more important than money. So if I can do that, that then, then I can pass it on. Naka. Naka. Ufemi, I can get you. And also, when we talk about systems and failing the system, the system failing us, if we don't get it right early, we are we're, we're bound to fail. Thank you, um, Stanley. Yes, that's correct. I, I mean, I cannot uh, weep for years. Early childhood care and education have been harping on this. It has, we've, they've been listening to us for, but not enough to be able to, um, um, to sort of turn the system around. And um, we are just lucky too that the, we have a national kindergarten curriculum framework or guideline called the Nananda Matani Viva. And that was written by the local people or Fiji people for the children of Fiji. So what is it that we want? A visionary document that also, what is it that we would like children, children of Fiji to be like? And it's clear, happy, healthy, um, so that they, and all those um, working um, with other people, lifelong learning, so that's where they will be. But um, the other thing that has just sort of uh, what my attention just uh, from last week is that, again, the consultation. There is, I know, there is a, a consultation now on the national, um, to set up a national standards for a national diploma in early childhood. And this is sitting up there with the, but where has, who have they consulted? It's just bringing people at the last minute to probably to endorse the the document, but I think we need to remember, this is for the children of Fiji, the future of Fiji. So it is not my document, it is not their document, it is everyone's document. So we need to really consult widely, and I'm glad that is coming out strong in this um, platform. And may I just add, we need champions for early childhood care and education at village level, at district level, and we do have a National Council for Early Childhood and Development. This is comprising of all the sectors. So uh, I hope that that will bring to fore the cries or the, the voices, to amplify the voices of the young and vulnerable citizens of Fiji. Thank, Thank you very much. Mr. Hatch, what does it take to transform from the industrial era education to the 22nd? 21st and 22nd century education. Um, I, I believe the, the big change that has to happen is in the delivery. So to change something, you need to stop something. And we need to stop our road learning. And we need to stop believing that a fixed curriculum with fixed content and too much content will deliver the outcomes that we need for 21st century. We need to stop that, and we need to, um, I believe, have the political will to put together a task force and uh, made up of practitioners, made up of community leaders, to get out in, and, and, and experts to be able to work amongst all the schools management to change the mode of teaching. Thank you. Dr. Nilesh Gaunda. Uh, thank you, Stanley. I believe the, the overall the model of education system that we have is, is working fine. 
we don't need to mend something that is not broken. What we need to do is to identify where the gaps are. And as Sir Maya mentioned, uh, in the dropouts. Uh, if, if, if the system is failing students and their dropouts, we need to identify what is the real reason for it. Is it the curriculum? Is it the teaching learning process? What is it? So uh, let's look at where the gaps are and how we can, we can solve the issues uh, that, that, that are present uh, within, within the whole, whole system. But I believe that we have a model that has worked for 100 years and the model is, is a good model. It can work. We don't need to throw the baby with the bathwater. What we need to do is identify where the gaps are and how we can fix the gaps. There's a lot of creativity going on in our schools. I visit a lot of schools. I talk to a lot of teachers. I look, talk to a lot of head teachers and principals. And you'll be amazed once you, once you go in, inside of the schools to hear the stories, how they bring back children who, who had uh, were stopped coming to school, the extent to which teachers go in terms of working after hours, and so on. So what we just need to do is to relook at uh, where the gaps are and how do we strengthen the existing system. Mm. That's, that's actually a great point I just want to touch on before I get to Larry's. Some of it's being done, it's maybe not being done enough uh, in Fiji at the moment. Larry? Thank you, Stan. Uh, at, at your in your introduction, you talked about mental health. I think that's something we haven't really talked about is mental health. You know, if, if a child at the age of seven wants to commit suicide, then that's a huge problem. And I think we, we need to, you know, look at the system, and we've been talking about that. In 2000, there was an education uh, commission, uh, which was comprised of Suliana Swatimbao, Professor Subramani, and Helen Tavola. The coup happened, and the commission report was shelved. It's a massive report, and as a colleague of Professor Subramani, he talked about traveling right across the country to the most remote of schools. And, and it was sad what he saw, that particularly at the boarding schools. And, um, but but, but, the, but the, 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 the report was, uh, was shelved. I think we need to relook uh, at an education commission that needs to travel right across the country and, and look at the, our whole system. You know, uh, 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 before independence, there was a commission, and then, of course, in 2000, that was 20 years ago. Some things have changed. Most things have not changed, you know. Um, and I'd just like to say that our education system affects us all, you know, whether we like it or not. Um, I like to think of it that we are all shareholders in our education system. And as shareholders, we need to ensure that our children and their children get the maximum benefit uh, to enjoy a system that nurtures them, that supports them, that guides them, towards their dreams, towards their, towards their aspirations, and as Sarah Maya says, to, to becoming better and good human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, rethink, relook, reimagine our education system, but if you want to do something, make sure you do it with consultation. Larry, Dr. Nilesh, uh, Mr. Hatch, Ufemia, bye. Thank you for joining me on this panel on education, which has been very, very enlightening. Uh, please, we welcome your feedback and comments uh, to this panel, and um, uh, anything you wish to say, uh, we'll be happy to, to welcome them. This marks our seventh week of reset. This education panel, it's been a pleasure bringing you this, this platform for dialogue, because that's what it is, and we hope to take it into the next uh, level, and hopefully it can uh, lead to some action in the future. But join me and uh, the reset team next week, Sunday. We're bringing you our season finale. Uh, bringing in some, uh, some of the top, some of the key speakers from our previous panelists and, and a discussion on how we move the Reset Fiji platform forward. I'm Stanley Simpson from here at the Lodala campus at USP. Good night. <laughs>